this is a fascinating account of the Lord's work with Moses, his servant. When God called Moses to go down to Egypt and to lead God's people out of bondage, Moses had some concerns. And those concerns come to us by way of what seems to be excuses. Excuses that hopefully would relieve Moses of this responsibility, but God was insistent. Moses was the man for the task. Moses was the one God wanted to use. And Moses was going to be the man to go and deliver God's people. Let's investigate together these concerns of Moses and a single lesson which he needed to learn, which turns out to be the answer to all of his concerns. In the book of Exodus, we are continually reminded that God will prepare His people for what is ahead. Reminds me of proper preparation. Proper preparation should be the first blank, I believe. Whether He is preparing a leader like Moses, an assistant like Aaron, a large group of people like the Israelites, or even a smaller group of those people like the Levites, God will prepare His people for what is ahead. While Moses had excuses, God had answers. The first excuse comes in Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Moses asked, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? God said, Certainly I will be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship me at this mountain. With his first response, God lays the foundation for their working relationship. The key principle for Moses to work from and the criteria by which all things should be evaluated. God, in effect, said, it's not about you, it's about me. It's about me. And I promise to be with you. The second excuse and answer come in chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. There Moses asked when they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God responded by declaring, I am who I am. Now obviously you recognize that's not a name, but it is a play on words. I am is to be understood as I will be or the one who exists by his own power. The title expresses the very presence and care, the concern and the relationship of the one described. To answer the second part of this second excuse, God instructed Moses, Say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you. This was to establish Moses' authority to speak in the name of God. But God comes back and more directly instructs Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, Yahweh, Yahweh, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. We understand God to be saying, I am the God who exists. I am the God who will be. I am the God of relationships. I had a relationship with your fathers caring for each one's needs, and I will have a relationship with you, Moses. And when you go down to Egypt and bring my people out, I will have a relationship with the sons of Israel. The third excuse Moses gives is in chapter 4. Beginning in verse 3, Moses asked, What if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, The Lord has not appeared to you. Moses prejudged the people. Moses preconceived their response. But notice more specifically God's response, God's answer to this concern. God told Moses, Throw your staff on the ground. And when he threw the staff on the ground, it became a snake. God said, stretch out your hand and grasp it by its tail that they may believe that the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. 
Next, God instructed, now put your hand into your bosom. And when he pulled it out of his bosom, it was leprous, like snow. God said, put your hand back into your bosom. And when he pulled it out again, it was restored like his flesh. Now these two signs, Moses was immediately able to carry out and immediately see the results of. The third sign which he gave to Moses concerning this excuse was if they will not believe even the two signs or to heed what you say, then you shall take water from the river, water from the Nile, and pour it out on the dry ground. And the water which you take from the Nile, it will become blood on the dry ground. This was for Moses to use when he was before the people when he had gone down to Egypt to carry out God's will. In effect, we might take it that God is speaking to Moses and saying, I will provide what is needed. More specifically, I will provide what is needed when it is needed. The fourth excuse that Moses gave comes in verses 10 through 12 of chapter 4. Moses articulated, I am not eloquent of words. I am heavy or difficult in speech and slow in tongue. God countered that by asking, Who has made man's mouth? Or who has made mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Have not I, Yahweh? Have not I, the Lord? Now then go, and I, even I, will be with your mouth and teach you what you are to say. God revealed to Moses, I will provide. I will provide for you the words you are to say. I will be with your mouth. The fifth excuse, more like an objection, a final appeal to try to be relieved of such responsibility. Moses said in chapter 4, beginning in verse 13, Please send by the hand of whom you will send. God responded, Is not your brother Aaron the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. In essence, God said, I can send whomever I want. I can send the one I want, and you're the one. I want to send you, so I will send you. But I will also send Aaron with you. I will be with your mouth, and I will be with his mouth. He shall speak for you to the people, and he will be as a mouth for you, and you will be as God to him. You see, God recognizes every person's limitations. He knows every person's need for help or assistance. He knows who he can use to help each person fulfill their own responsibility. In each case which Moses had a concern, God gave an answer. God gave a response that shows that God was preparing Moses for what was ahead of him. If we have excuses for not doing the Lord's work, we need to give those excuses to God. God has a solution, and God will enact His solution when we give our excuses to Him and allow Him to provide. He will prepare us properly. Thus Moses would have to learn God's key to proper preparation. And that key is, it's about me. But that leads Moses then to a presentation paradox. A presentation paradox. God presented Himself to Moses back in chapter 3. In verse 2, the The Bible says that the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. That bush grabbed Moses' attention, so he went to investigate. As he goes over to the bush to investigate, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. God explained then to Moses why he had appeared to him. Then he gave him a mission. Come now and I will send you to Pharaoh so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. You know the response of Moses. We just went over it. The response of Moses shows that he was reluctant to go. As prepared as he was, he was disinclined 
to go. After having all of his concerns addressed, he still was hesitant to go. In fact, he would return to his excuses in chapter 6, beginning in verse 12. When Moses did go, he first went to see Aaron. And it was the message of God, not, Aaron, not Moses himself, that convinced Aaron to go with him down to Egypt and present himself to Pharaoh. Read with me Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 27. Exodus chapter 4, beginning in verse 27. Now the Lord said to Aaron, Go to meet Moses in the wilderness. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. The Lord commanded Aaron to go and meet Moses, and that phrase in the middle of verse 27, so he went, suggests that there was no hesitation in his movement. Aaron immediately went. Now Aaron met Moses in the wilderness at the mountain of God. Continue reading verse 28. Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord which he had sent him, and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders of the sons of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. He then performed the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, then they bowed low and worshipped. Upon hearing Moses, Aaron quickly joined with him in the work. It was not the presentation of Moses that convinced Aaron to go, but rather the message of God. But Moses and Aaron, as a team, presented themselves then to the people in verses 29 through 31. And so at the beginning of verse 31, it says the people believed. It means that they were convinced by what they heard and what they saw from Moses and Aaron. Their response then was to bow low, to kneel down and to worship, to prostrate themselves before God with their faces to the ground. Moses and Aaron then presented themselves to Pharaoh in chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. And afterward, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord, that I should obey His voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Now, going back and understanding and considering the context of the world at that day and time, there were so many different people worshiping various gods, and knowing the personal names of each god was important because they would have to call upon the name of their specific god in order to call their powers into being. Pharaoh was being truthful when he asked the question, Who is the Lord? He knew of many gods, but he did not know of the one true and living God. He did not know of Yahweh. So Pharaoh would not listen to or obey the Lord because he knew nothing of the Lord. And so in response he said, quite arrogantly, I will not let the Israelites go. But notice this presentation paradox, if you will. Moses was reluctant to carry out the best presenter's instructions. Aaron, on the other hand, was ready to go, so he went because of the message of God, not the presenter of the message. The sons of Israel came to believe, and they worshipped. Pharaoh did not believe and would not humble himself to learn. A presentation paradox is that we put more pressure on the presenter than on the recipient. Moses may have been feeling some of that pressure as he had his concerns about going before the people of Israel and going before Pharaoh. Such pressure has kept many from sharing the gospel, even in today's world. Knowing who we are and who we represent 
having an adequate knowledge, having expectations of the recipient, being an excellent speaker and wanting help from others are important in sharing the gospel. However, they should not keep us from sharing the gospel. Moses was using these excuses to try to relieve himself of the responsibility of going and doing the Lord's will. Each of these important parts, which Moses was concerned about, were provided. They were provided by God when Moses went to fulfill God's calling. The presentation paradox for Moses specifically was that he was properly prepared. He went and he was faithful to do all that the Lord had commanded. Yet the results were not what Moses expected. They were not what he wanted. Concerning the presentation paradox, Moses would have to learn, it's about me. This left Moses, though, in a perplexed position. When the presentation and the, or the preparation and the presentation are the doings of God, there is an expectation of success. But not just any success, great success. We expect great things to happen because we prepare things according to God's will. Because we present them in the way God would have us to present them. We expect great success, and rightfully so, for God declared in Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11, So will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire and without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. When the focus is shifted by man from God's word, God's mouth, God's return, God's desire, God's success, we are in a perplexed position. We leave ourselves in a perplexed position wondering why we're not obtaining the success we expected to have. God had revealed to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3 verses 7 through 9 His intended purpose for calling him to go deliver the sons of Israel. He said, The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have given heed to their cry because of their taskmasters. For I am aware of their suffering, so I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians, to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Havite and the Jebusite. Now behold, the cry of the sons of Israel has come to me. Furthermore, I have seen the oppression which the Egyptians are oppressing them. God was telling Moses, I have a mission. I have a responsibility to my people. And I need you to go and carry it out. Following this first encounter with Moses, or between Moses, Aaron, and Pharaoh, Moses was in a perplexed position. Chapter 5 and verse 22, Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Lord, why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? Moses lacked understanding. He knew that he had done that for which the Lord had sent him. He said what he was told to say. He did what he was told to do. He expected, therefore, great success. But when the success by human standards was not evident, Moses was perplexed. Why did you ever send me? Verse 23, Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Moses was very strong with God. He expected great success. And when the success did not come, he blamed God. Moses would have to learn. 
that in his perplexed position, it was not about him, but it was about me. What a powerful proclamation. It's about me. No, it's not about me, the human. It's about me, the one who said it's about me, the I am. You see, God wants us to understand that everything is about Him. It was this way from the beginning. Going back to Exodus chapter 3, looking at verses 7 through 8, God said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I am aware of their sufferings. I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians. Go to Exodus chapter 9. Exodus chapter 9, beginning in verse 13. Then the Lord said to Moses, Rise up early in the morning and stand before Pharaoh and say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For this time I will send all my plagues on you and your servants and your people so that you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For if by now I had put forth my hand and struck you and your people with pestilence, you would have been cut off from the earth. But indeed, for this reason, I have allowed you to remain in order to show my power and in order to proclaim my name through all the earth. Still, you exalt yourself against my people by not letting them go. Look at chapter 13, verses 14 through 16. These words were spoken to the sons of Israel as they were instructed to consecrate their firstborn. Exodus 13, verse 14, And it shall be when your sons ask you in time to come, saying, What is this? Then you shall say to him, With a powerful hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. It came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I sacrificed to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. So it shall serve as a sign on your hand and on your phylacteries of your forehead. For with a powerful hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. After successfully crossing the Red Sea, the following words were uttered in chapter 14 and verse 31. When Israel saw the great power which the Lord had used against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and they believed in the Lord and His servant Moses. The powerful proclamation of God is not just for God's people. It's not just for the rebellious either. The powerful proclamation of I am is for all people in all the earth. God wanted Moses to learn, it's not about you, it's about me. And so whatever the excuses are, I'll provide a solution. Whatever the concern is, I'll provide a resolution. Whatever the presentation paradox may be, set it aside. It's not about the presenter. It's about me. It's not about the perplexed position that you will be left in at times wondering why you're doing the Lord's will in just the right way, but success is not coming. It's about me. God repeatedly said of Himself, It's about me. This message is to be remembered. This message is to be repeated. Moses would have to learn the most powerful proclamation that one can say. The most powerful proclamation that one can live is to show the world, It's about me. It's about the I Am. So unless our preparation for spiritual life, our presentation of earthly life, the position of focus in life, or the proclamation of the eternal life are about God, then success will be fleeting. And if any one part of this gets misaligned, success may still come, 
but full potential will remain unreached. So how will we respond to the great I Am? He's told everyone how to prepare for what is ahead and even provided the means to do so. He has presented His message in what we know as the Bible. His message tells us about our position in sin and His position in holiness and what He has done to ensure that we can be forgiven of our sins. Our lives ought to share with others the powerful proclamation which God revealed to Moses so long ago. It's about God. Have you learned this valuable lesson? The single most valuable lesson for daily living? The most valuable lesson for doing the work of the Lord? The most valuable lesson for you spiritually to receive? The crown of life? The crown of righteousness at the judgment? The answer comes from God who stressed it time and time again. It's about God. Me, the I am, the ever-present, all-caring, truly concerned, relationship-seeking God of our fathers. He is the one who prepared Moses, who presented Himself through Moses, who positioned Moses for real success and powerfully proclaimed His name through Moses to all of Egypt, all of Israel, and indeed all the earth. That same God is calling you, just as He calls everyone, to hear the truth, John 18, verse 37, to believe in Him and His Son, John 3, 16, to repent of sin, Luke, 15, or Luke 5, and verse 32, and to confess His name, the name of His Son, Philippians 2, 9 through 11, and to be baptized into His Son for the forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2 and verse 38. It's the same God who's calling all Christians to live faithfully to Him. Galatians 2 and verse 20. You see, when we take the focus off of God and place it on ourselves, we fail to see the true significance of what God is preparing us to do. In all of life, God is preparing us to be with Him. And He's calling us to be a Moses, to stand in the place of one who will proclaim His message to all others so that they can be relieved from their bondage and to be with Him, to be with Him eternally. So if you're ready to seek God's help for your concerns or struggles, if you're ready to accept God's offer of salvation through His Son, or if you're ready to return to Him after straying from Him, we'll do all that we can to help you. We'll do all that we can to assist you. But in the end, it's all about God. It's all about the great I Am. He will take care of all your concerns and all your needs if you'll make them known as we stand and as we sing.